Okay, uh, you can probably tell we're at a different location today uh, because of the, the virus uh, epidemic going on. Uh, I'm doing this from the house. I uh, know it's kind of weird. Uh, forgive me because I got dogs all over the place here. I got a dog over here that's just sitting there apparently. Uh, cats and all sorts of things, so you may see them. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, anyhow, this is for uh, CJUST444. Uh, what I want to do is go over some of our related terms. I'm hoping you guys had a chance to uh, see the first video, kind of the expectations of the class. Uh, you, a lot of you guys have already turned in your white collar crime uh, definition uh, papers. Looks like you all have a loose uh, basic understanding of what white collar crime is. Uh, really, it's just those crimes that aren't uh, accomplished by any sort of uh, force or fear. Uh, by force we even talk about like breaking into a, a warehouse or a home uh, or using a weapon or something like that. Usually these crimes are built on trust. Uh, that's one of the things you're going to hear over and over and over again. Um, some of the related terms are going to be very important uh, in your understanding and, and often they'll coincide with a uh, a white collar crime investigation. So I'm going to do this via lecture and then uh, you guys should take copious notes. Uh, that way when I give you your uh, quizzes online, uh, uh, basically it's going to be a question response type thing, uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, respond to those appropriately. Otherwise you'll have to sit there and watch the whole lecture while you're taking the quiz and that would be a bummer. Okay. So anyhow, uh, some of the white collar crime related terms. These are, uh, these are terms that, uh, in crimes themselves, that we deal with quite a bit uh, whenever we're doing any sort of investigations in what we call economic crimes. Uh, first one, of course, is embezzlement. Embezzlement is very important. That's gonna, uh, I'm going to do my own lecture on that, just specifically on embezzlement, embezzlement because it's such a uh, big crime. Okay. Um, the, the California Penal Code for embezzlement, if anyone's interested, is 503 of the Penal Code. That's not anything you need to memorize. Uh, but if you ever get a hankering to creep through or tiptoe through the, the California Penal Code, which is about four or five inches thick, then be my guest. 503 PC. Uh, basically, the fraudulent appropriation of another's property by a person who, to whom it's been entrusted. That's the definition. Uh, what we're talking about here, it could be as, as small or minor as a liquor store clerk pulling 20 bucks out of the till and stuffing it in his pocket. Uh, that liquor store clerk is responsible or entrusted with that cash register. Uh, he or she taking a $20 bill out, putting it in their pocket, appropriating, appropriating it for their own use or means is a crime. It would be a $20 theft. Okay, and it's actually a... a penalized in the same way theft is. So it would be a petty theft. Okay. Uh, the next crime we uh, often encounter is burglary. Now this is one that's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Uh, people don't understand what burglary really is. Uh, everyone thinks burglary is a theft. It's not really what it is. Um, it can be. It can be a theft. But burglary by very definition uh, it's 459 of the Penal Code. Again, not anything you guys need to, to memorize. Uh, but every person who enters any house, room, apartment, tenement, shop, warehouse, store, mill, barn, stable, outhouse, or other building, tent, vessel, with the intent. That's the important part. With the intent to commit grand or petty theft or any felony, any felony at all, they're guilty of burglary. So this is less about theft, even though a theft can, again, be involved. And it's more about going into a building, going into a room with the intent to either, there's my, my dumb Carlin Pincher, uh, Miyamoto Musashi, greatest samurai of all time. Um, anyhow, getting back on track here. Uh, imagine going into a liquor store. And you go inside a liquor store and you see something really cool in there. I don't know, what the heck, uh, just the most amazing tube of toothpaste you've ever seen in your life. And you just have to have it. 
but you didn't establish the intent to steal anything until you were inside. You steal that tooth, the toothpaste, you, you know, run outside. That is not burglary because you didn't have the intent before entering. Now, if you have the intent and you say, okay, we're going to do a beer run. We're going to steal a whole bunch of uh, Zimas. No, you're going to have to look up Zima. Um, you can steal a six-pack of Zimas from the liquor store. If you had the intent before you entered, then that is burglary. Okay, now it could also be something very terrible. I enter a house, I break into a house to commit an assault, to commit a rape of all things. Um, something terrible like that, that could also be considered a first-degree burglary, sometimes what they call a hot bird. Uh, and these are crimes we see quite a bit with white-collar crime. Uh, we get it with our contractors, our, our fraudulent contractors. They'll oftentimes victimize elderly folks, and they'll enter the home, uh, have them do up a contract, basically take their money, and we could talk about contractor fraud later, but if they, in if they entered with the intent to commit this fraud, that is also not just the, the fraud and the elder abuse crimes, but also burglary, okay? So again, uh, you want to make sure you understand the crime of burglary. It's not just theft, okay? Um, also, just on a quick note, everyone says, oh, I got robbed. Someone broke into my house and robbed me. No, they didn't. If they broke into your house and stuck a gun in your face and said, give me all your, your money, that is a robbery. If they break into your house while you're at work and take your Nintendo uh, 64, that is a burglary, okay? Much different, okay? So anyhow, uh, let's get into uh, the, the next crime. It's uh, quite common, theft by false pretenses, okay? So theft by false pretenses, a crime is 532 of the penal code. Don't need to know that. But the definition is every person who knowingly and designedly by any false or fraudulent representation or pretense, defrauds any other person of money, labor, or property, whether real or personal. Real property often is like houses and things like that. Uh, or who causes or procures others to report falsely of his or her wealth or mercantile character. So these are applications for credit. Okay? And by thus imposing upon any person, obtains credit, and thereby fraudulently gets possession of the money or property, or obtains the labor or service of another, is punishable in the same manner and as to the same extent for larceny of the money or property. So it's punished by the same um, penalties uh, carried by theft, uh, fall, uh, felony and petty theft. Uh, the difference is, this is, think of theft by false pretenses. I, I lie to you to get you to believe me so that you'll, uh, so that you'll give me the money, okay? Uh, so, um, I decide I want to go buy a $40,000 Harley Davidson. I wouldn't buy a $40,000 Harley Davidson. I like Italian motorcycles. They're very cool. Uh, but, if you are so inclined to own a, uh, Harley, okay, uh, then you go down to the dealership and, and you make $11 an hour and you work part-time. And your yearly wage is $20,000. But instead, in the loan application, you put down that you make $150,000 and you're the CEO of your own company. If that dealership believes that you, uh, in fact, have that ability uh, to make payments equivalent to someone uh, making $150,000 a year, and they give you that loan, and you falsified that documentation, that's going to be theft by false pretenses. You, you basically stole that from them. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have given you that credit. Uh, it, th there's a lot of different ways this crime can occur. Uh, but basically, we're, we're doing it by trickery or deceit. Okay, think of those two words. Okay? Uh, again, punished by the same uh, uh, penalties as theft. So either grand theft, which will be uh, for the lecture, not, uh, over $950. So $950 and one penny okay, is going to be a felony, anything above that. If it's $950 or less, then it's petty theft. 488 of the penal code. Petty theft. Uh, a misdemeanor. Okay? Uh, felony, um, grand theft obviously is a felony, 
and uh, that will be 487 of the penal code. Again, you don't need to know the penal codes. Uh, one of the next crimes, and it occurs quite a bit in any sort of uh, white collar crime setting, is what we call conspiracy. Okay? Conspiracy is when two or more persons conspire to commit any crime, whether it's a felony or misdemeanor. Okay? Uh, basically, they falsely and maliciously try to indict another for any crime. They lie to, to get someone else in trouble or procure another to be charged or arrested for any crime. They, they do something basically together, it has to be two or more persons, um, to try to get someone in trouble. Okay? Uh, they falsely uh, move to or uh, maintain any suit, action, or proceeding. So, I try to sue you. Uh, this is not uncommon. Um, besides uh, uh, other crimes that we're going to talk about, extortion and such, uh, often um, people will work together to commit these sort of crimes. Uh, so anyhow, a, uh, two or more persons who conspire to commit any crime, felony or misdemeanor, or falsely and maliciously indict another for any crime, or procure another to be charged or arrested for any crime. Or, basically, they try to cheat and defraud any person of any property, by any means which are in themselves criminal or to obtain money or property by false pretenses or by false promises with fraudulent intent not to perform those promises, okay? So, uh, we could talk more about conspiracy, but the biggest thing is that two or, two or more people work together to commit a crime, okay? And that's 182 of the Penal Code, and it is a felony, actually, even if you conspire to commit a misdemeanor. Now, keep in mind the DA's office prosecutors can do what they want. Uh, they could charge it as a misdemeanor, but that isn't what uh, the section reads. But they have that uh, ability and leeway, as, as you will. Okay? Uh, okay, we talked a little bit about grand theft. Grand theft, again, is just uh, any theft of any merchandise, property, money, uh, anything like that. $950 or more, sorry more than $950, so $950 and one penny, and then any amount over that. That will be grand theft, okay? Uh, if it's $950 exactly and less, then it's petty theft, a misdemeanor crime, usually punishable by up to a year in county jail, okay? Or a fine. Okay, the next crime we discussed earlier, extortion. Uh, common term you hear with this is blackmail, okay? Blackmail is is not really a term we use uh, in a legal uh, legal settings anymore, but that's what that's how we most know it. Okay, so extortion is is interesting. Um, so I'm going to just read it right off here, so you guys have the actual definition. Extortion is the obtaining of property from another with his or her consent. That's the big difference with his or her consent or the obtaining of an official act of a public officer induced by a wrongful use of force or fear or under the color of official right. So, um, gosh, there's a, there's a bunch of ways to commit extortion. Uh, uh, I, I investigate quite a, quite a few of these things. Uh, some, one of the more um, uh, current cases we've had are, are these folks that go out and uh, try to uh, threaten to sue small businesses for uh, ADA, American with Disabilities Act violations, or gender discrimination lawsuits. Uh, they do so, uh, there's a legal way to do it. You get an attorney or you go to court and you file a suit under ADA or uh, gender discrimination uh, laws. Okay, You file a civil suit, that's legal, you could do that. But if I go up to a business and say, hey, I, I went outside and I noticed your, uh, uh, your handicapped parking uh, uh, stripes weren't precisely accurate, you either pay me $2,500 or I will sue you for $20,000. Okay? And, and that's usually how it goes. If they do that, that could be considered extortion because they're, they're making the person believe that if they don't pay them, then they're going to be brought into court and sued. It would be legal and appropriate for them to just sue. Just take them to court and do it. Okay? Um, 
there are other ways to do this, obviously. Uh, ransom, you know, is a common uh, theme. Um, basically, if you don't do this, then I'm going to do that. Okay? And that's how we obtain the money with their consent. Uh, we're not... We're not necessarily putting a gun in their face and saying, give me your money. We're saying, hey, if you don't do this, if you don't accomplish this act, then uh, I'm going to take it to the law. I'm going to I'm going to let your probation officer know uh, I'll do something that's going to cause you legal uh, concern or issue uh, it can be considered extortion. OK, uh, the next one is identity theft, probably the most popular and common crime on the planet Earth right now. Uh, identity theft, uh, oh, by the way, extortion uh, is going to be 50, uh, oh gosh, 508 of the penal code. Um, again, not anything you need to know, but if you want to look it up, it's always uh, fun to do that. Uh, now we're going to go to identity theft. Identity theft uh, is 530.5 of the penal code. Um, there are a lot of different ways to steal a person's identity, not just their name. Okay, so the actual definition, it says every person who willfully obtains personal identifying information of another person and uses that information for any unlawful purpose, including obtaining or attempting to obtain credit goods, services, real property, or medical information without the consent of that person is guilty of a public offense. Uh, generally, this is a felony crime, a serious crime. Um, how does one commit identity theft? There's a million different ways. Uh, so, um, someone rummages through your mail and gets a check, let's say, uh, and then they recreate that check. Uh, and we'll talk about this later on in the class, how to, how to do this, unfortunately. It's very easy. Um, how to recreate a check. And then uh, they use that information, your information, your name, your address, your account number, doesn't have to be all, all of those things. It could be any one of those things. Any, any number, anything, any indicia that is specific to you um, to identify you. If someone takes that and uses it to, to gain money, property, services, anything like that, that is identity theft. Um, it could be quite difficult to investigate, quite difficult to catch the crooks because so much of it is done online now. Um, but identity theft is probably the number one crime on the planet right now. Okay, uh, forgery. Forgery is uh, 470 of the penal code. Uh, 470 forgery. Every person with the intent to defraud. It, we always have to have the intent there. If we don't have intent, we don't have a crime. Okay, uh, knowing that he or she has no authority to do so, signs the name of another person or of a fictitious, per, a fictitious person is guilty of forgery. Now the, the, the big element here is with the intent to defraud. Uh, so I always joke about this. If I just take and I write your name, I write your name on a piece of paper. That's not forgery. Even though that's what Webster says forgery is, okay? But we're not in the world of Webster now. We're in the world of criminal justice, uh, law, things like that. So we have to understand those concepts. Uh, Forgery is, is signing another person's name, okay, with the intent to defraud them, to take something from them, and otherwise steal from them, okay? So if I take your check out of your checkbook, or if I find a check on the ground, a blank check, and I sign your name to that check and put my name in the, in the payee spot, uh, knowing that I don't have permission to do so, and then uh, cash that check, Simply, that's forgery. Okay, um, a lot of different ways you could commit this crime. Okay, but again, I'm signing your name with the intent to commit fraud. Okay, so what about oh, I don't know. Uh, what if I I am at work and I forget to complete some document? And I tell my buddy, hey, hey, buddy, do me a favor. Will you just sign my name to the bottom of that document? People would argue that's forgery. It's not. There's no intent. Uh, it may not be the best way. It may not even be a legal way uh, as far as the document itself goes. That, that document could be um, now uh, null. It, it could be uh, not, not a worthy document, trustworthy document. Uh, however, 
no crime has occurred here, okay? Uh, because I gave that person a permis permission to sign my name. Uh, think of forgery as a crime of theft. I'm, I'm trying to uh, sign your name so that I could take something. Uh, doesn't have to be specifically from you, but I'm making you liable for that now, okay? Uh, let's see. Let's talk about, real quick, destruction of evidence. Uh, destruction of evidence is uh, section 135 of the Penal Code. It's just a misdemeanor, but it's uh, uh, one of those that can happen quite a bit, uh, especially with white-collar crime. People will try to destroy paperwork or devices or whatever. The unfortunate thing for them is uh, most of the time, once you commit some form of white-collar crime, the evidence is still out there. Uh, but if any person were to try to destroy the evidence, conceal it, then um, uh, that would be considered destruction of evidence, okay? Uh, so here's the, the book definition for destruction of evidence, Penal Code 135. Every person who, knowing that any book, paper, record, instrument, or writing, or other matter or thing, other matter or thing, anything, uh, is about to be produced in evidence upon any trial, inquiry, or investigation, whatever, authorized by law, willfully destroys or conceals the same with the intent thereby to prevent it from being produced, is guilty of a misdemeanor. Not a bad little charge if you believe that occurred. Okay. Uh, the next one is computer intrusion. This is one we uh, get quite a bit. It's going to be section 502, subsection C, subsection 4 of the Penal Code. Basically, anybody who accesses your computer without your permission. Um, the, here's the textbook definition. Knowing, knowingly and without permission, uses or causes to be used computer services. So it could be the, the actual computer or phone itself or iPad, whatever it is. Uh, but it could also be that person who hacks into your Facebook, ha hacks into your Instagram, um, somehow or another gains access to your internet service and, and does a bunch of shenanigans there, okay? If they do it without your permission, that is in fact a felony, computer intrusion, okay? Uh, this happens quite a bit in dating relationships, uh, you know, we'll have a lot of uh, folks that like to gain their their significant others, uh, devices, phones, computers, and then, you know, post all sorts of nonsense. It is a felony, okay? Uh, the last one we're going to discuss for this particular video is uh, elder or dependent adult abuse, specifically financial. Um, that's going to be 368 of the Penal Code, subsection D or subsection E. Uh, subsection D uh, is, is just typical standard financial elder abuse. Any person commits it. Um, subsection uh, uh, E, or actually subsection C as well, can be by a caretaker. Uh, carries a little bit more weight uh, during prosecution. So any person who is not a caretaker, who violates uh, any provision, laws uh, prescribing theft, embezzlement, forgery, or fraud that we've discussed, or who violates any section per prescribing identity theft, which we talked about, with respect to the property or personal identifying information of any elder dependent adult and who knows or reasonably knows uh, that that person is an elder dependent adult has committed elder abuse, financial. Uh, physical elder abuse, that's under 368 A and B. Uh, we won't be discussing that for this class. Uh, but financial elder abuse is quite a big thing right now. Um, basically, you have uh, family members that will help themselves to their their elderly uh, uh, family members uh, checks or credit card. What is an elder? An elder is any person 65 or older. Any person 65 or older. Uh, just that in and of itself is enough to say that is an elderly person. However, we also have what they call dependent adult status. Dependent adult is any person in between the age of 18 and 65 who basically needs significant assistance with their daily care. Um, any one of us could be a dependent adult at any one time. Uh, say we're stuck in the hospital for a week. We've had some sort of surgery or some sort of uh, procedure done. We're in a hospital bed recuperating. 
At that point in time, you are a dependent adult. You're unable to, to take care of your daily essential needs. So some, uh, I hate to say it, but some uh, hospital employee goes in and digs through your, your clothes, finds your wallet, steals your credit card, it's happened, uh, and then uh, runs up your credit card. Besides the credit card theft that, that we'll discuss later, it could also be considered financial elder abuse or dependent adult abuse in this case. Um, a person who perhaps is developmentally disabled to a, to a level where they can't care for their their daily essential needs. They could be considered a dependent adult. Um, so anyhow, uh, I just wanted you guys to get uh, familiar with some of these general terms because we will be discussing them throughout the course. Um, I know it's a lot to hit you with. Uh, I will be picking several of these and uh, giving you guys basically uh, a quiz on, on you know, some, some of them, not all of them. Uh, but we'll be discussing them later on in class. Uh, and again, I'm going to do a uh, specific video on embezzlement because embezzlement is just so significant right now. Um, anyhow, uh, that's it. Make sure you guys take good notes. I'm sorry if I spoke really fast, uh, but uh, you can always replay it. Okay. And uh, thank you for bearing with me, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have the next lesson to you uh, very soon. Here. Thank you.